but there was one incident that happened on the second day. The aerial unit that rotated had a very large capacitor in there. And this capacitor was a buffer capacitor that stopped the bounce when the aerial stopped and changed direction. One morning, one of the directors, one of the rotators, men rotating the aerial came to me and said, the aerial cabin was on fire. So I opened the door and looked inside and I saw smoke and flames coming out of this very large capacitor. I disconnected it and dragged it outside to let it cool off a little bit. Then I realized, looking at it, there was a dent in the side. Probably it had been bumped about when it was unloaded from the various LSTs and ships and things, and there was a short circuit inside this capacitor, and the oil was being scorched and burning inside it. Um, I got Taff Lewis, our cook, to come along and help me to bring a very large cooking tin. When the oil cooled down, we poured the oil out, and the pair of us, Taff with a pair of plies pulling on the lid, and me with a large soldering iron, we undid the top of the capacitor and could check the inside. I straightened the plates very, very carefully to make sure they didn't touch. I reassembled the capacitor and we soldered it up again. This was the second most important thing that I'd done in Sicily. The first, obviously, was fishing Nick out of the sea. We put the aerial capacitor back inside the cabin and started the rotation working again, much to everybody's pleasure. Because up till now, some of the men were having to push the aerial around so that we could carry on with operations. After maintenance one morning, our medic, Bert Best, asked if we'd go along to the, Ma to the MASH hospital nearby to collect mosquito and flea repellent, salt tablets and plasters. With Benny driving the three-ton Bedford, Vic in the cab and me outside on the back, we drove towards the town and the ramp that led down to the hospital. Benny misjudged the narrow turn-off and the truck slid down the slope and ended up on its side near the reception tent. Benny climbed out through the roof. Vic was dragged out unconscious and carried inside the tent on a stretcher and I fell in a heap on the ground. The medics roared with laughter at the arrival of the limeys and asked what we wanted apart from first aid. We told them. Then the master sergeant asked if we wanted a drink just to help our recovery. He asked Benny if he wanted a shot in his orange. He did so and the master sergeant poured orange over half a tumbler of methylated spirits and passed it over to Benny. Benny took a great gulp of this stuff and exploded, spitting out the lot. More roars of laughter from the Americans. Then the, the master sergeant said it was his favourite drink. With supplies in a box and a bulldozer gently pushing our Bedford back onto its four wheels and Vic recovered, Benny was advised to drive back across the fields to our little camp as he still felt dazed. We thanked them for their hospitality and said they'd be very welcome to come along to have a look at our radar in action. They came next morning and told us they were pulling out the following day, moving up towards the front line. We gave them a couple of bottles of whiskey for their kindness and off they went very pleased. Now we were the only permanent camp on the plain of Jaila, waiting to get our orders to move up to the north and soon, we hoped, into Italy. This came fairly quickly. We packed up, ready to drive inland. The road across the island took us past yellow sulphur hills on the lower slopes of Mount Etna. We got to the coast road in the north and drove to Milazzo, a small town. This was close to the front line and the Germans who were still defending Messina and they were evacuating their forces across the narrow straits into Italy. We made friends with the people of Milazzo. We went along into the town and bought one or two bits of film and odds and ends from the shops. And in the photographers, 
there was a chap taking photographs. And we said, we said to this, this fellow with the camera, uh, we asked him rather, would you like to come along and take a group photograph of our little unit in the olive grove? He was delighted. He came along in the middle of the day when there's plenty of sunshine. Vic, who fancied himself as a photographer, came along and supervised things. And there you see all the crew. The, the 40 odd of us, either sitting, kneeling, sitting or standing in the olive grove on Milazzo. The olive grove at Milazzo where we were camping was next to uh, a vineyard with delicious muscatel grapes. We found the grapes very, very quickly and they were superb. We wanted somewhere to put our toilet seats ready for the loo, so we dig appropriate trenches in the olive groves so we could sit on the toilets and reach out and eat the grapes. We ate all the grapes uh, within two or three days after various trips to the toilet. And when we'd eaten all the grapes in one spot, we picked up the toilet seats and moved them further into the vineyard to get a fresh lot of grapes. Our stay in Milazzo enabled us to check our apparatus after five weeks of non-stop operations at Jaila. Our operations in Jaila proved very beneficial. According to German st statistics, um, radar and bombers under our control destroyed over a thousand Luftwaffe planes on the airfields and around the island. Our camp in this shady grove was very happy to be out of the war. The Germans must have left this camp in a great hurry because we found several vehicles in very, very good condition. We had a lot of fun driving around particularly on a BMW motorcycle and sidecar with a machine gun mounted on it. But the most useful of all was a DKW three-cylinder uh, uh, small lorry, a water bowser in excellent condition and full of pure drinking water and this we added to our convoy for the rest of the war. The town photographer came along to take group, the group photograph at this time in the shade of the olive trees. Pressure from the Americans and the Brits on the Germans at Messina forced them to evacuate during the hours of darkness over a period of, of a few days and mainly through the nights and they got most of their equipment and supplies across with no loss it, losses. General Patton, who was the leader in charge of the US 7th Army, entered the empty town as conqueror and we moved in to follow to find an empty LST at the dock ready for the invasion of Italy. This invasion of Italy was a two-pronged attack with the British on the toe of Italy and on the Adriatic and the Americans and some British troops on the west side, that included us. The Salerno beaches were within aircraft support distance from Malta and North Africa. The invasion fleets were assembled from many ports and around Sicily and all along the African coast and uh, away from German reconnaissance planes. Our LST in Milazzo would join many more ships sailing from Messina into the darkness to pass the volcanic island of Stromboli in the early hours and sail away towards, towards the invasion area at, uh, at Salerno. Now, why General Patton and General Montgomery didn't capture the 65,000 troops in Sicily at Messina, I don't know. With all the aircraft and guns available on ships, the Allies could have destroyed all the dock facilities on both sides of the Messina Straits and made evacuation impossible. The Germans would have had no supplies and they would have been forced to surrender. It was very, very bad planning and probably due to a clash of personalities, which could have been overruled by General Eisenhower if he'd known about the situation.